<laughs> right. Um, good evening, Craig, and good evening, everybody else. Welcome to uh, Bournemouth, or welcome to LA, whatever it is. Now, I just want to introduce Craig Levinson to everybody. You you know him, you know his books, you know his work. Um, I've known Craig for, i rather not tell everybody, 20 years or more, I don't know. Um, more. <laughs> well, I know, yeah. We've been uh, many parts of the world, had many beers and solved many problems, and then promptly forgotten the next morning. He's always been a tremendous friend to me and to ACC, and I really appreciate him um, coming along and talking to us today. So, Craig, over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and it is an absolute privilege uh, to virtually be back in Bournemouth. Um, we do need to, to drink uh, a beer together uh, as soon as possible. Uh, that's that I think it has to be stated right up front um, and as Neil said uh, we started together a long time ago um, when I was invited by Neil and colleagues uh, to come out to Bournemouth in um, shall I shall I say when Neil um, uh, I'm, this was in the 1980s uh, so I was actually in Bournemouth for the first time in 19 or not not 80s 1997 does that sound right that sounds right that sounds right yeah that's no right. i think it's earlier no i wouldn't because no 97 97 97 so i don't want to admit dementia it. has set in and i i'm getting my decades all effed up folks uh, <laughs> but it was 19 1997 when you spearheaded starting the first master's program in the chiropractic profession and it's funny how things go round and round because um, we find we're in the same boat today, folks, that we were then. We've, we've uh, struggled with what's called progress. And I think the pandemic has presented an opportunity to learn from our mistakes. Uh, it's a period uh, that I look at uh, as a period of creative destruction. Uh, we shouldn't let a good a good crisis go to waste, and we have the convergence of the pandemic and uh, institutional racism um, and the inactivity crisis, all three together. Um, and I think where they all converge is in the social determinants of health. So in the field that you are all entering into, there is this beautiful synergy Welcome everybody. So I don't know how far I got before we had a little calamity there, um, but I was explaining how back in 1997 I came to Bournemouth and it's a pleasure to come back, but Neil was ahead of the curve because he was presenting a master's program, the first ever in chiropractic, uh, on evidence-based practice and was wise enough to realize that uh, the challenges were going to be in implementation. And sure enough, we've seen that's the case. We can, we've been presenting uh, evidence-based practice since 1987 through the CSAG and RCGB in England, the AHCPR in America and all over the world. And we haven't moved the needle. The status quo is hard to budge. And there are a lot of vested interests against us. And uh, in the master's program, uh, Dr. Osborne, uh, and colleagues uh, were very, very uh, a, a aware of the issues that would occur in changing practice behavior and pivoting towards things that were best practices like education and exercise. And so the first thing that was instituted in the master's program, what was called a clinical audit process of how you can learn how to uh, discern good from bad evidence, learn what to trust, and lo and behold, that's become a bigger issue now with the overwhelming amount of data points that we have on social media. Um, secondly, it's hard to change people's behavior. Uh, people have done things a certain way for so long um, and that the status quo is very hard uh -huh. to change. And that harkens me to the work of Stephen Jobs, who said, um, uh, uh, better to be a pirate than join the Navy. And so I think it takes a lot of courage uh, for each of you to live up to these principles that are the principles of change and progress, principles that are espoused by all the great leaders of the past, people like Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, and we see today in this convergence of the crisis of institutional racism with the pandemic and the inactivity crisis, 
that the real problem that each of you are going to face in practice is it's not just about biomechanics and psychology. It's about the environment people are in. And this is what's called the social determinants of health. So a lot of people argue about uh, pain science and biomechanics. This is a, a faux argument. It's a pseudo argument because if you look at a person's context, if you look at their social environment and you learn more about that person, where they're from uh, and what they believe and what they've been told, uh, you can begin to build a bridge to that person. And it's through that empathy that you can find a compassionate road for them to help them to become more functional again to free them from being hostage of their musculoskeletal pain. And so this is what we call uh, uh, the principles, reassurance and reactivation. Um, and this is what I teach. We have a website, First Principles of Movement. Um, my work is, is available freely. You, all of you have been introduced to the recent pandemic webinar series on high value musculoskeletal care, prehab and rehab. Um, and we've learned something very valuable that when we constrain our behavior as healthcare professionals, lo and behold, constraining healthcare professional behavior, constraining the status quo, eliminating the vested interests of profit from procedures leads to higher value care as expressed in the Lancet expose on low back pain. Because education and exercise are not constrained by the pandemic and by guiding by the side. So what we see is that scans are down, surgeries down, injections are down, and so is the use of passive physical therapy modalities. And what is left, what is left is empowering people to self-care and self-management. Teaching people that hurt doesn't necessarily equal harm and that reactivation is the road to recovery. So this is what I'm gonna present right now. Uh, you got my handles here, you'll get this slide deck later. Um, so you can reach out to me, you can email me, you can go to our websites, et cetera, follow us on Facebook. But I want to stick with facts. I don't want to interpret for you. That leads to stultification. You need to, to be aware of the facts yourself and you, you will be driven towards uh, the best practices conclusion. So what we know is since 1990, there's been a 54% uptick in low back related disability. We also know that low back disability is the number one source of disability in the world. We know that the costs associated with musculoskeletal pain and disability exceed cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. And so you are at the very, very uh, uh, most powerful place as a healthcare professional to create change, to produce progress. So we need to do what Neil taught, which is the clinical audit process. We need to introspect and look at ourselves with humility to see if possibly what we've been doing before is wrong. And that's what Dr. Levitt taught, my great mentor from Prague. Keep an open mind for new ideas that sometimes show what you thought or believed before was wrong. And this is the attitude and posture of a scientist. A scientist does not defend their beliefs. A scientist creates a hypothesis and exposes it, exposes it to robust testing and expects it to fail so they can learn from their mistakes. And the sooner you learn from your mistakes, the sooner you find something you can trust. So the gap between best evidence and practice and back pain must be reduced. We need to redirect funding. This is the vested interest. This is the profit model away from ineffective and harmful tests and treatments towards approaches that promote physical activity and function. This is your challenge. You are the future. So we already know, and we've known for since 1987, 1989, what the guidelines have said as far as what the meta-analysis have, have concluded. We know for acute low back pain, exercise therapy is a first line treatment. We know spinal manipulation is a second line treatment. And that's actually good because most things are debunked. Most things have evidence of ineffectiveness or lack evidence of effectiveness. Whereas spinal manipulation, passive modalities, et cetera, manual therapy has evidence of effectiveness. But the strongest evidence of effectiveness is of course education and exercise. So you know this already, this is all summarized in your prestigious Lancet journal, the three-part expose. And here in second part on prevention and treatment of low back, presenting the evidence and challenges and promising future directions. 
a conclusion emerged. Much of modern back pain care is ineffective or based on insufficient evidence or is actually harmful. And you know this to be true. You know scans are dangerous. People are vulnerable when they're in pain. They get a scan. Scans always show wrinkles inside the body. And yet the interpretation is I have a deteriorating spine, a narrow spinal canal, a torn labrum, herniated disc. Uh, the, the disc is effacing the nerve. I have a large herniated disc. I have a ruptured disc. I have a torn disc. The language goes on and on and on. One of the problems for your future patients is they're following Dr. Google and they're listening to all their friends and back pain is so common and ubiquitous that everybody has tried something. And since the natural history is most people get better no matter what is done to them, one person will say, see a chiropractor. One will say, don't see a chiropractor. One will say, get it fixed, get an MRI, find out what's wrong. Somebody else will say, don't do surgery. It's very confusing. And it's very confusing for you because it's hard to keep up with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and publications and your classes and the doctor you're going to associate with and your friends and what sort of treatments you've had in the past. It's very hard to gain a GPS, which is why I focus on principles. I focus on evidence. I focus on facts. There we are freezing up again. Um, so the best practices, key messages are actually fairly simple. There isn't a lot that we know. The only known effective intervention for secondary prevention um, is exercise alone or combined with education. The first choice should be non-pharmacological. So we promote self-management and routine use of imaging is not recommended. So is this limited to low back pain, these problems, these status quo, cognitiveness, dissonance, biases, these profit-driven vested interests? No, no, we see that we've been sold a bill of goods, that the populations of the world from rich and poor countries alike are all living longer, but are we living better? And the answer is no. We see that the percent of adults with chronic health problems, and this has come out in the COVID epidemic, that the people under 60 who are vulnerable are those with asthma, diabetes, heart disease, uh, and obesity. And that's younger people, and they're at risk of hospitalization and even death from, from COVID-19. So we see in 18 to 44-year-olds that 27% of people have chronic health problems. If you look at this chart, this chart shows that what relates to whether or not you become disabled later in life, and so many of us are living to be older, and the, the skewing is occurring towards the percentage of population that is older, is growing larger and larger, so much so that by 2030, there will be more older people than younger people alive in the world. And older people have less capacity and have more disability. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about education and exercise. Why? Because what determines whether you're disabled later in life more than anything else, what determines whether you have heart disease, cancer, or musculoskeletal disability later in life is differences in strength and balance. Successful aging, as Stephen Hawking said, has to do with eating less and moving more. In fact, Stephen Hawking, before he died, recorded a one minute video where he concluded the video by saying the cause of most disease is we move too little and we eat too much. And why it is more people don't realize this is beyond my comprehension. So we face a double whammy today. And we know from meta-analysis and guidelines all over the world exactly how much PA we need. We need 150 minutes of physical activity spread out over the week, about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and twice a week of strength training. And yet, what do we see in the musculoskeletal arena? We see people being managed away from load. This has got to stop. We're creating rehab purgatory. It's not the load that breaks people down. It's the load they're not prepared for. So people are focused on the activities. I should stop doing this because that's what the doctor said. Oh, that hurts. Stop doing it. Let pain be your guide. That's the opposite of reassurance and reactivation, which are, again, the sine qua nones of evidence-based musculoskeletal practice. We want to empower people. We want to reassure people that what's on the scan is only a partial truth and that not every hurt equals harm and the road to recovery is that the motion is the lotion. Hey, Dad. This is your job. 
Yes. I'm just talking to, is this the seminar going on right now? Yeah. I'm back to my meeting. Welcome. Join us, sir. So on this slide, <laughs> you see how this problem begins at a very early age. It starts before the age of five. And if this doesn't shock the crap out of you, then, then hello? Somebody, somebody has a question, please. No, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. I, I, so um, you see here that before the age of five, 50% of children do not meet the PA guidelines before the age of five. We're talking video games and iPads and poor parenting and lack of playgrounds and, and things of this nature. Before the age of five, already the behaviors that will lead to disability are being programmed. Now let's fast forward to, to much later in life. The rate of muscle mass loss from the age of 40 is 8% per decade, rising to 15% per decade by 70 years old. And yet it's reversible. 15 years of decline in muscle strength in people over the age of 75, mind you, these are people at a very high risk of a fall, and a fall is the number one or two cause of mortality in people in their 70s. These are people on the cusp of being at risk of frailty, and yet there is a treatment. There is a treatment for this, this disabling disease of sarcopenia, and it is resistance training. And three months of resistance training can reverse 15 years of decline. So why would we want to emphasize drugs? Why would we want to emphasize drugs when drugs don't address the cause? Why would we want to miss out on the gift of injury, as Professor McGill calls it, and not give people something more powerful than any drug? which is the prescription for exercise. We often confuse the effects of inactivity with the aging process itself and believe certain diseases are purely the result of getting older. What 50 year old who has a hip or a knee problem doesn't go and see a doctor and get an image and they go, ah, you have degeneration, it's wear and tear, learn to live with it. I'll give you pills if you can't live with it. Avoid things that hurt. And when you can't live with it anymore, I'll fix it. Actually, our modern sedentary lifestyles have simply speeded up our underlying age-related decline. And this contributes to all of the uh, comorbidities that we now realize are related with COVID-19. Type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, asthma. Fewer than half of 16 to 24 year olds meet the recommendation for aerobic and muscle strengthening exercises. For 65 to 74 year olds, it falls to fewer than one in 10. So do the math. You're going into a field where you'll be a musculoskeletal expert and musculoskeletal medicine is, the, this is the primary machinery of life, this musculoskeletal system. You are in the ideal place to influence upstream factors that determine people's health. And we're gonna have an aging population and nine out of 10 people over the age of 65 are not doing the preventive things they could. So you are at that ideal place, that platform where you can influence people's behavior. According to Lisa Berkman at the Harvard T.H. Chan uh, Harvard School of Population and Development Studies, she said there is evidence from national studies that people who are now in their 30s and 40s may actually be in worse shape than people were a generation ago, thus increasing diabetes, obesity, and other chronic conditions. So what we now realize from the, the great work of people like Lorimer Mosley and Peter O'Sullivan, Greg Lehman and the like, we need to stop with the nocebos. We need to stop scaring people. We need to focus on self-efficacy, on giving people confidence because confidence is the cornerstone of great performance and it comes from one place what people say to themselves. So our job is again to go back to the evidence reassurance and reactivation. And what this does is this puts an end to overprotection and under preparation, which is the more modern way of saying reassurance and reactivation. We've been overprotecting people by telling them to brace and avoid flexion and don't do this and 
avoid what hurts and every hurt equals harm and let's get a scan and then giving them labels for their diagnosis instead of reassuring them that what they have is a is a uh, a simple problem uh, which is going to get better over time uh, which isn't sinister um, and through aggregation of marginal gains we're going to start to build up their floor until they have enough capacity to handle their demands. So here you see all the false positives. These are just the facts. I don't need to, to describe this to you. You already know all the false positives. You know why scans are misleading. Scans are part of a profit generating medical industrial complex. And the words matter because you get a scan, then you have a label and the label scares people. People are told they have a wear and tear of their bone on bone. How many people that are told they have bone on bone actually have bone on bone? Very few. People think every hurt equals harm. If it hurts, don't do it. Well, that's unrealistic. We want to think of a traffic light metaphor. Green is like three or four out of 10. Yellow is like five or six. Red, we avoid. Five, we discuss. We look both ways before we cross the street. But the lower levels, uh, of course, are, um, are not going to do anything other than cause atrophy. So if we can appreciate that pain is a protective device, not a measure of tissue damage, and we, and this is what we need to learn to do better at, including myself, if we can communicate that to people, then we can change the game. Because what is the game? The game is about changing behavior. The game is about empowering people and giving them the confidence that they can succeed. Self-efficacy is the game. And of course, this is what is best discussed over a beer. Here I am with Tommaso Barucca from Milano, an AACC grad, and the great Neil Osborne. <laughs> and I will be back. So we are here today to discuss knowledge translation and how to bridge the gap from science to practice. And this is the hardest thing. Your challenge is so hard because status quo is so powerful. And there has been a universal failure to implement best practice evidence um, that has been disseminated since the 1980s. This has been a uh, tremendous failure, but it's not our failure alone. This is a general failure for all science. It takes 17 years to get only 14% of research into practice. So my hope is that the pandemic accelerates that because what, what, what is a good crisis other than an opportunity for change? And we don't want that to go to waste. So we've been discussing um, uh, why we should focus on education and exercise on reassurance and reactivation, on overprotection and under preparation. And you've learned a lot of skills and we teach these in FPM. We try to upskill you into how to do assessments for floor dysfunction, um, how to distinguish mechanical sensitivities from painless dysfunctions, how to find the hardest thing that people does well, how to describe why we're doing what we're doing to people. And of course, when we talk to people and we explain why we're doing what we're doing, this is called relatedness. And that's how, how we implement a change. It's how we give people confidence. So your challenge is to upskill these benchmark principles so you can hit the ground running with these methods. We have a, a whole blog at FPM, at firstprinciplesmovement.com, on um, how to upskill and do a needs analysis. Um, and how to focus on the social determinants of health, which are the farthest upstream. So if we think of the biopsychosocial, I ignored the social. I learned about the bio and I learned about the, the psycho. I put those together. Then we have warring tribes, pain science and biomechanics. It ain't about either or. The code breaker is the social. Learn about your person. Learn about their environment. Do they have green spaces near them? Do they have access to group fitness? Do they feel that the group fitness that's around them is too hard and they're, they're fragile? Um, do they expect you to do passive care? Are they looking for a quick fix? So we have these warring tribes and where is the truth? Alf Nakamson, one of the great evidence-based orthopedic surgeons who took all of the surgeons to task for unnecessary surgeries and scans, said, I've been studying low back pain for the last 50 years of my life. And if anybody says they know where the pain is coming from, they are full of shit. And then you have Professor McGill. All pain has a cause and a thorough assessment will reveal the cause with only rare exceptions. Where is the truth? Dr. Paula Silva, who's written one of the best papers of the last 20 years, uh, with her colleague from Brazil, 
Daniela Vaz said, I'm open to being wrong all the time. That is why I am a scientist. I put things to task asking, is this helpful? And this is the scientific posture. We form a hypothesis, we test it robustly, robustly looking for the minimally viable product, the one that withstands our testing. And it's only by exposing our hypothesis uh, to robust testing that we can really trust them. We have to realize that what's popular isn't often evidence-based and what's evidence-based isn't usually popular. And we have to accept uncertainty because each person is different. There are myriad ways, there are myriad roams, roads to Rome to help enable a person, to, to rehabilitate a person. One person who called flexion intolerant gets worse because we call them flexion intolerant. We give people, we give somebody who's, who's so-called flexion intolerant bracing and they wind up becoming rigid. Maybe there are other approaches as well where we teach people um, through reassurance that they can relax and that not every hurt equals harm. And lo and behold, they start to become less forward bending and tolerant. We want to avoid dogma. Some people need neutral exercises. Some people need relaxation exercises. Some people need hip mobility. Some people need torso training of their abdominal and gluteal muscles of the pillar. Each, each person is different, and it's our job to thin slice, to find, uh, to find uh, the tipping point cues, which help to unfold things for people. Great things are not accomplished by those who yield to trends and fads and popular opinion. So I hope that each of you will study the facts, and you'll make up your own mind. If you look at this, this is a good example. This is an exercise from Professor Mosley. A good example of how sometimes what you see or you hear or you're told or you think, as Dr. Levitt said, turns out to be wrong. If you see here, you see two boxes, different shades. Now what I want you to do is take your hand horizontal and place it along the horizon line. And everybody do this. Okay, so Neil's gonna do it too. And just place your, your hand horizontally along the horizon line Close one eye, and what do you see? Both boxes are the same. They're not different. So often, what you see is what somebody wants you to see. So we want to keep an open mind for new ideas that sometimes shows what we thought or believed before was wrong. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn, as Alvin Toffler said. So as Tim DeFrancesco, States here, a friend of mine who was the strength and conditioning coach and, uh, and, uh, and an athletic trainer with the Los Angeles Lakers, said, I'm amazed at how many doctors and physical therapists are telling patients who need gradual resistance training to stretch, rest, ice, take a pill, and immobilize instead. Please stop. This promotes fragility. So what is rehab? Rehab is to show people what they can do for themselves. Carol Levitt. Basically, I'm teaching you how not to be a doctor. And if we spend less time trying to be like Batman and be a fix-it man, and more time trying to be like Alfred and guide by the side, I think we start to automatically fall in to best practices, where we're able to inspire confidence and give tangible hope and achievable plan. We still can use passive therapy. Passive therapy is still valuable. It's just not the highest value, and we can use it as a catalyst, or you can use it as an accessory, or as an adjunct. It's basically like a cough drop. It's symptom relieving, but it doesn't change the course of the cold. To increase confidence, patients need to actually attempt something they themselves previously feared. This is cognitive behavioral training. This is graded exposures to feared stimuli. And then achieve it and recognize it as their own. Independence and control are fostered by teaching people to self-reinforce and to attribute their gains to themselves. So our job is to create a safe environment where few people realize that they're not going to injure themselves, where not every hurt equals harm. So you're reassuring them. And then they start to move and you find the path of least resistance. And lo and behold, on the back end, people experience that the motion was the lotion. And it wasn't that it wasn't that they were fragile, it's that they had become too stiff. So, so we have a saying that the hurt you feel becomes the feeling you hurt. 
And the way around this is to give people a positive experience with movement. This is always our goal, to give people a positive experience with movement. So this is my process, and I'm gonna show this as the last slide and take some of your questions in the time we have left. We examine people. We take a history, we do a needs analysis. The needs analysis is what are your goals? What are your concerns? What have you been told? What's your injury history? Where do you hurt? What do you think is wrong? What are you worried about? We get at their yellow flags, we get at their activity demands. This is a, uh, uh, something where we're looking at all their key performance indicators. What do they want to achieve in the future? What do they want to get back to? What are their activity intolerances? And this is the demand analysis. And then we do our exam and we see if they have what they need. Do they have the current capacity to do the things that are required? And then we slow cook, and that's the rehab. That's bridging gap. This is called gapping. This is a gap analysis. This is the architecture for best practices, is take a history. I spend 45 minutes on my history, and I detail everything. And when I'm done, this is motivational interviewing one-on-one. -on -one. When I'm done, I say, I, I repeat it back to them, what they told me, and I say, did I get it right? Was there anything else? And they go, no. And I go, are you sure? And they go, well, da, 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 da. I go, okay. And there's no rush to get to the exam. And then I examine them. And from the examination, we're already starting to see what's green, yellow, and red. We're seeing what has acceptable technical proficiency and what is unacceptable, like in the FMS scoring. A one is unacceptable. A two is acceptable, acceptable dysfunction acceptable compensation. What we're looking for is the floor. We're looking for what's painful, which is a zero in the FMS, and what's a one, which is unacceptable dysfunction. And those become the goals. And the means is the mud, it's the twos, it's, it's all of the stuff that's not perfect. It's not in their comfort zone, but it's a painless dysfunction. We start by rebooting the painless dysfunctions. Whether you're doing a bird dog, whether you're doing a side bridge, whether you're teaching a hip hinge, uh, whether you're doing breathing exercises, whether you're doing um, jujitsu warm-ups, 90-90 shin boxes, um, whether you're doing a goblet squat, um, we want to find the hardest thing they do well because there's no adaptation if we take away all stress. And that's one of the reasons why passive care is not the highest value care because we need to challenge people at the edge of their capability. And stress is a stimulus, and there's a poisonous stress, which is too much, and then there's a, a sub-threshold stress, which doesn't do anything, where people are spinning their wheels. That's the rehab purgatory. That's managing people away from load. We need to provide a stimulus that challenges people so they actually achieve something they didn't know they could achieve. This is how they attribute to themselves, and they gain confidence. They build self-efficacy, and then the cortisol modulates, and then they gain the confidence they can succeed, and their protective mechanisms start to, 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 to lay down a little bit, and they become more resilient, and they become less fragile. So our job is to do this type of analysis, a needs analysis, finding out what their demands are, do an assessment, see what their capacities are, start to bridge the gap, slow cook it. So let's take a couple questions. I know some of you have, have written in. Uh, Neil, do you want to throw it to the audience? Um, yeah, absolutely, And have absolutely. them uh, ask, ask their questions? Yeah, Just absolutely. unmic them? I'll, uh, what I'll do before I unmic them, and we have, uh, uh, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? We'll unmute everybody. If you're not going to be talking, could you mute yourself, please? So I'll get that. So everybody should be unmuted now. Um, mute yourself if, uh, if you would. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come in beforehand and we've got a couple of questions coming today. So um, first up, Ben Goodall. So Ben, um, do you want to ask your question, Ben? And I think Craig may have answered this in some respects, but uh, why don't you go and ask your question, Ben? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess <laughs> without sounding like dogmatic to some kind of uh, yeah, without saying dogmatic in, in terms of how, how, how I'm viewing pain or whatever, but, but if you've got someone that has a movement that they find 
painful so like for myself because I come from a gymnastics background it hurts a lot if I go into too much extension all the time and so a lot of stuff I've had to do is around like neutral spine for myself and I know perhaps with this model I don't, I don't you're not trying to fit it to a, to a one size fits all but I guess <laughs> you're kind of saying to to avoid um making people think that they're fragile and trying to get them to do movements that perhaps used to hurt them so that they can realize that hurt doesn't equal harm. But I guess where, where's the line being drawn with that? Cause you know, for, for some people perhaps going into that movement will just always hurt them. Or maybe I don't fully understand it. I don't know what's kind of take on that. Um, before you, and have you that's a, that is absolutely a, a spectacular question. I, I'm really grateful that you've asked it. Craig, um, appreciate it. Craig, before you answer, sorry, would you mind just, um, uh, stop sharing your screen and assuming you finished just so we can see your, your beautiful face. You can't see me? No. I don't know if you want to see this old man. Well, wow. Okay. Okay, thanks. Better? So that is a spectacular question, Ben. So um, this is where the person-centered approach comes in. So you'll notice that in the third edition of ROS, it's, it has a title change, which is uh, kudos to Lorimer Mosley for um, recommending that. And actually, um, he persuaded me that I wasn't teaching a practitioner's manual, but a patient-centered approach. And in a patient-centered approach, what we would identify is your apprehension and your history and your intuition and your own sense that, you know what, uh, I've done wear and tear to my back, I'm sensitized in extension, and I'm better when I avoid extension. Um, and then what I would do is I would create a therapeutic alliance with you, Ben, and I'd want to find out what your goals are. And if your goal is to actually uh, restore your range of motion or reduce your sensitivity, then we'll create a plan to achieve that goal. If your goal is something else, like, like, like you just don't care about that, um, and your goal is you're seeing me because you have a hip problem, then we're going to uh, create a fence around the hip area. So we might find that you have an internal rotation issue in your hip, um, and we would address that. Uh, but let's say your goal was to increase your spinal extension tolerance. I would uh, tell you um, that if we avoid extension, you're never going to adapt. So I would explain what the process of adaptation is, and we would go about slow cooking. And I would uh, explain to you that the studies show if you avoid something, it only rusts more. Um, and so I'd start to kind of create some uncertainty in your mind so that you're open to the possibility that there might be a different road. Um, and of course, we don't dive in, we follow the traffic light. And so we realize, and the studies are, are, are rampant on this, on Twitter yesterday, Ben Smith and Chris Littlewood uh, posted about um, hurt not equaling harm and painful exercises actually have slight benefit over painless exercises. And there's a blog on this on FPM. Uh, where I've done um, a long-term long, long -term dialogue with uh, Professor Silvernail, who's an expert uh, with Roland, who developed the visual analog scale. And this idea that hurt equals harm is, is one of the first things that we debunk in, in evidence-based practice. So um, we don't avoid everything that hurts, but that being said, when you're onboarding people, sometimes you find something that is painless, and you start to build it up and you use what's painful as an audit. And so we use it as feedback. So I might do neutral exercises and heavy bracing and then go back to extension. Is it any better? Uh, no or yes. If yes, cool. If no, and it sounds like yours is persistent, um, then we might say, okay, there are many roads to Rome. Let's try something else. And so we might see you don't tolerate standing back extension. How about prone? And we do the Cobra. No, you don't like that. How about the Sphinx? Oh, you don't mind that. Great. Let's do Sphinxes. So we find the hardest thing that you do well or the hardest thing you tolerate. Maybe we go into a bird dog and you do bird dogs with a fucking flat back. Oops, I'm sorry. That's my French. <laughs> That's okay. uh, it was bound to happen. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, sorry, no, not sorry. Um, we're, so we're uh, you do a bird dog with a flat back. Well, what happened, happened to neutral lordosis? So now we look at your squat. Squat requires a lordosis. So we start loading your squat. Let's say we do an overhead squat, which is the FMS test. It's also the SFMA test, and you don't like it. And then we do something else, like we do a bunch of T4 moves because we have something called triple extension. And if an athlete doesn't have triple extension, they probably ain't an athlete. And triple extension is extension of the 
is, is an extension of the knee, hip, and T-spine. And when you lack that, you tend to go into a lower cross syndrome or open scissor, and it can create sensitivity in the low back and extension, much like somebody who said, has been told they have a spondy, may be afraid because they were told they had a spondy of extension, and they avoid extension, then no wonder it's still sensitive. So beliefs are very powerful things, and there are many ways to thin slice this. So what I might do is I might do bracing. What I might do is I might do prone sphinx. What I might do is I might do a bunch of T4 stuff for your dead zone, and lo and behold, you now have in the kinetic chain more load sharing, and now you tolerate extension. And the goal is, in the end, to be able to do the things which in the beginning you didn't tolerate. So we have metrics. We can't manage what we can't measure. This is part of thinking like a scientist and acting like a coach. So every case is different. I have to know what you've been told. I have to know your history, your gymnastics history. I have to know what you think, what your intuition is, what your horse sense is. And, and, and we have to be empathetic and, 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 and work together through therapeutic alliance. It's not my way or the highway, and I don't know what will work. I am so uncertain. But one thing I do know is we'll get there. By hook or by crook, we'll get there. And I'll be, I'll be your ally. And if you don't get extension, you're going to become a slump, slouch, stooped old man. Because this is human. The lordosis is human. The ape is semi-upright. The hominoid is fully upright. So I don't know if that helps. But. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Good answer. I like that. Um, good. Okay. There's another one, uh, which I'm going to sort of paraphrase slightly, which is that in the NHS, so I'm sure one of the drivers is money, but in the NHS, what tends to happen is that the... Um, patient goes and sees the physio department and the physio department will then reassure them and give them leaflets for an exercise and discharge them. And a lot of the complaints that we get is that it didn't even touch me, didn't even do any manual treatment. So people want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are take a McKenzie course, number one. Um, so McKenzie has been at this the longest, uh, the first, foray into blending psychology and biomechanics uh, in a positive, affirming, empathetic, and compassionate way is the McKenzie method. So they've, they've, they've already trod this path before. Yeah. So I would say expose yourself to the experts on this. Secondly, follow Peter O'Sullivan on, on Twitter. Peter O'Sullivan provides videos. Go to First Principles of Movement. Go to LA Sports and Spine, my office. We have videos of people guiding by the side. Um, uh, thirdly, take FPM. This is what we address. Fourthly, this was dealt in the webinars. So we have 10 webinars on this, over 20 hours of material where we address this. The three things that we addressed in the webinars with respect to high value prehab rehab uh, were uh, uh, basically um, uh, number one was this uh, idea that patients are afraid that hurt equals harm. So how to address this? And, and it's not by boot camp. It's not by ignoring their feelings. It's by explaining the pain, the pain traffic light. It's by explaining that not every hurt equals harm. And what happens when you avoid, avoid, avoid? You actually get what you're avoiding. Um, uh, so, so that's number one. Number two, it's that expectation of the patient. So patients are not only fearful that hurt equals harm and fearful of activity, uh, but patients are expecting certain things. So what I want to do is find out what their goals are. So they tell me what they think is wrong and they tell me what they think is going to help them. I'm here for you to put your elbow in my QL or release my tight psoas or crack my back or give me dry needling, um, uh, do boxes with wires, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but then I want to find out what their goals are. And once I find out what their goals are, that opens the whole room of possibilities to, okay, well, let's talk about how to achieve those goals. And it turns out that, that the motion is the lotion is the number one thing. And if all we do is take a fix it approach, then we don't address the source. So, so we start to get buy-in for let's find out why you have this and let's see through what, what, what Professor Mosley calls uh, uh, neuroplasticity. Let's see how things have gotten programmed and habituated to become protective of the pain. Um, and then here's the little sleight of hand that we do. When we're assessing them, we are treating them because Professor Yonda said, every exercise a test. So what do you think I'm testing? I'm testing movement. I'm, I'm putting people into the bird dog and the cat cow. I'm putting people into a, a, a half kneeling position or 
a tall kneeling hip hinge. I'm putting people into a, a bird dog position, a side bridge position, a, a, a quarter squat, the athletic foundation, and I'm doing a checklist. We're inventorying. This is a red, this is a yellow, this is a green. Uh, this has technical proficiency and could be loaded. Uh, this is, is, is unacceptable dysfunction and needs uh, to be tuned. Um, and when we find the hardest thing they do well that they tolerate, we then repeat it. And the person starts to have a positive experience with movement. It's all very clandestine. And then we go back to something that was very sensitive and they look at us and they go, wow, that was unbelievable. That was magic. That is the goal. The goal is for them to have a positive experience with movement. And when they say, wow, that was magic. What did you just do? You go, that's not magic, that's neurology. And you explain that the motion is lotion because before they wouldn't have listened to you. Then the icing on the cake is all the low value crap. So we do low value care, as Lancet calls manual therapy. We just do it after, after our assessment. But our assessment is actually a trial of graded exposures to feared fucking stimuli. This is not, this is not complicated. The architecture is so simple. What's, what is complicated is every person is different. So you need to be Sherlock Holmes and realize this is deductive. Anybody who tells you they know all the answers and is following an inductive approach is not a scientist. And I am passionate about that. You need really? to challenge people with vested interests. You need to challenge people who are certain. Uncertainty is the gold standard in science. And then you become person-centered. And I am passionate about that. So we are in a period of creative destruction where the, the unanticipated benefit of the pandemic is that we are learning things that can help people have healthy longevity. We can reduce disability. We can address the social determinants of health that are the source of the source and are upstream of disabling symptoms. And you as chiropractors are in the ideal position to translate knowledge into practice. You have been given all of the tools. So Excellent. I have a patient who has been waiting for me for 60 seconds. I understand. I, uh, let's, let's leave it there. There are other questions coming in, but it's uh, for another day. Maybe I'll send an email over to you. And we'll let's do this again and everybody watch the webinars. Um, yes, I'll send the link and, around for uh, the webinars. Look, look at chapter 5, 30, 38 and 39 in ROS. If you have the second edition, burn it. It's out of date horribly because it didn't appreciate social determinants of health. And all of you today now know that the social determinants of health are upstream of lifestyle choices. Do not guilt your patients who you think are lazy or who are afraid of pain. They're afraid of pain because of what they have been told. Words are very powerful. Language is very, very powerful. When people are told that they're out of alignment or they have wear and tear or bone on bone or hernia disc or narrow spinal canal, this is disabling. This leads to overprotection and under preparation. So you are in this beautiful place where you get to be this compassionate person, but first build therapeutic alliance through listening, listening. Cool. That's the most powerful technique of all is, is listening. Craig, um, we'll let you get to your patient. That's you. uh, really, really good, passionate and, uh, and inspiring as always. Thank you so much for spending the time to, to come and, uh, come and uh, give we'll us some tools of wisdom. Bye. We'll do it again. Lovely. Cheers. Bye for now. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, attended the uh, Knowledge Translation program on uh, Saturday. Uh, we had a couple of guests and went over some... Uh, 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 progressions and regressions for some of our basic uh, training uh, uh, from our basic training architecture, how we establish baselines and build integrity from the ground up. Um, but we'll be uh, carrying this forward again on Sunday. Uh, Jan Hertvinkensen will be with me uh, from Denmark. Um, Tyson Beach, from the great biomechanist from Toronto. Uh, a little more behaviorally oriented than, uh, than uh, Professor McGill, um, uh, but uh, co-author of many of his papers. Uh, and I'll have uh, a great physio uh, from uh, Seoul, South Korea, Raymond Lee, 
Uh, also, uh, physical therapist from New York City, Ryan Chow, um, and uh, another great coach who's in charge of the Equinox uh, training curriculum, Matt Barron. So any of you who want to join us on uh, Sunday, um, I'm sure you can find the information. You also get access to the video from last week. Um, and we have a, a bunch of resources for you on our Teachable platform. And and uh, students actually get uh, uh, a rebate of half the price of the program. Um, and uh, $100 will be donated to Black Lives Matter charities. So um, uh, hopefully you guys will take advantage of that. Um, and uh, of course our subject is, is our subject that we've been dipping into with Neil because Dr. Osborne was at the forefront of teaching how to sift through evidence um, back in 1997. Um, the first master's program in the chiropractic profession uh, was initiated by Dr. Osborne and colleagues at Anglo-European Chiropractic College in Bournemouth. Um, and the first thing that was taught was how to do a critical appraisal of literature, how to read methodology so you weren't a victim of uh, people trumpeting the abstracts of papers that they agreed with uh, via cognitive dissonance. Instead, you could look at the methodology and see if the, if the uh, uh, journal article was actually um, uh, worthy of uh, such praise. Um, number two, what uh, the master's program taught was what was called a clinical audit process, which was how to reflect on your own practice via a chart review, et cetera, of your uh, patient's charts to see whether or not you were practicing in a way consistent with evidence. And evidence has not changed. It has not only not changed since 1997, it has not changed since 1987. Uh, the evidence is very simple and the Clinical Standards Advisory Group from the Royal College of General Practitioners has outlined this in, in very simple details. And nothing has changed in the Lancet uh, or subsequent um, meta-analysis or guidelines. Uh, we know uh, that we should do diagnostic triage uh, to rule out red flags of sinister disease and to identify uh, nerve root patients. Uh, the rest of the practice, 90%, uh, is usually what we call idiopathic or nonspecific. It's usually mechanical, responds beautifully to conservative care, uh, including uh, high value approaches such as uh, advice and exercise and education and also adjunctively to passive therapy modalities such as chiropractic adjustments. Uh, it does not require imaging, and chart review should show that imaging was not recommended. It does not uh, require injections. Uh, it does not require, require anything more than temporary over-the-counter medication. It does not require surgery. Um, all of those things are nocebos, which we talked about last week. They are, they are iatrogenic, meaning that they cause doctor-induced disease. Uh, there is no virus, and we're living in a pandemic, uh, there is no virus more virulent than the idea that you are sick, according to Marcel Proust. So uh, we are very aware of this, and the evidence showed that since 87 and 97. Um, so number one was diagnostic triage, not scaring people. Uh, number two was providing reassurance um, that you don't have a sinister disease uh, and that uh, the prognosis is good. There'll be bumps in the road, but it's good. Uh, flares are to be expected, not to panic about, and um, uh, that we can get back to our life and that hurt may not necessarily equal harm and that if you've had imaging, uh, these are often coincidental omas and people, the stories that people tell every patient when you let them speak, the first thing they tell you is, I have da 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 da. I have deteriorating spine, herniated disc, ruptured disc, torn disc, large herniated disc, torn labrum, torn rotator cuff, degenerative arthritis, bone on bone, all lies, damn lies. Um, and uh, the next step after diagnostic triage and reassurance is reactivation. We've known since Mel Mavera's work, which Neil is very familiar with, uh, especially through the lenses of Indol and others, uh, that uh, general advice to become active is a sine qua non along with reassurance. So reassurance and reactivation are the alpha and the omega of evidence-based practice. And we should be able to do a chart review 
that you have done the triage, that you have provided reassurance and reactivation. And then, of course, you have your supportive modalities, which, which is uh, elective. Uh, the adjunct of therapies are elective. Uh, they're not of the highest value, but, but they're not debunked either. And they can be of value. And I find in my practice, when I go back, and I'm, I'm still doing telehealth, but when I go back, I, my patients have earned passive effing care, okay? They've earned it. Uh, they've suffered through uh, COVID and social distancing and stress. Um, just like if I was treating Kawhi Leonard or LeBron James, you earn your recovery. These people have earned it. They've earned the catalyst of soft tissue work um, and uh, chiropractic adjustments, et cetera. Uh, but generally speaking, the highest quality evidence for most cases, not just low back pain, uh, but we know that these things are, are uh, transcribable and their principles to all musculoskeletal pain um, uh, is the McKenzie model of guiding by the side like Alfred uh, and showing people what they can do for themselves uh, to empower them. So I'm gonna show you a case here and then I'd love to hear uh, some comments from everybody about what this triggers in your mind. Um, so hopefully we got sound. Yesterday. Can you hear that? But thank you for... Neil, can you hear? Yes, I can, the sorry. audio there? Yeah, I okay. muted myself. Yeah, we can, yeah. Oh, never, m please, Neil. We count on you to be unmuted. I know. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was doing. Thank you. We want your quips. Yesterday. But thank you for that exercise where we go into that uh, uh, jiu-jitsu thing and play, do the leg raises. Yes. Because literally, I would say it was probably better than anything else any exercise i've done that has helped me with the leg pain great the leg pain uh, great. so just to give you give me five exercises one was the severity walk one was one leg stands yes the other one you said about um, the jiu jitsu thing Yes. Yeah. The fourth and the fifth. I don't remember it off the uh, head. A plank. A low plank, sawing forward and back, which we'll go over in a minute. And then okay. massaging your foot with the lacrosse ball. Okay. So let me tell you what I was doing, which yes. one of those things really has helped to some that I could see a remarkable difference in. Because I would, this is almost like that shot if, uh, kind of difference. Uh, but I do get pain every day, and I'll tell you which all. I've been doing a uh, cat cow, mm -hmm. one style, like regular, then kind of putting my hands on the side, then putting your Czech, Czechoslovakian way, the third yes. style. Yes. And then I've been doing the Jiu Jitsu leg raises. And the third thing I was doing was Ball, uh, ball, not as much, but uh, I watched a video where I put a little band around my two legs and you l raise the leg on one side and the other side. Yes. I'm doing this. So these were the good. three things, four things I was doing. And uh, then apart from that, I would just take a little thing to move my neck around. But I'll show you what I did. But I would tell you that I will show you where I still, but I would tell you, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. I was, and this did. Excellent. Let's start with the two cat camels. The cat camels? Mm hmm. But thank you. Thank you, ma'am. This is, doctor, this is amazing. A good start. Good restart. I would tell you, I rather should have taken Zoom. I, I'm, I was like shocked when somebody told me Zoom call with a physical <laughs> therapist or with something. I said, this is like, when, for four weeks, I couldn't get my head around when you texted me. 
I took four weeks to come to you. I know. It's, it, it's surprising. And then uh, that guy it, told me. This can be effective. And the, I had asked him, who that uh, Ajay, when I'd gone to him the first time, and he says, Oh, you need a physical therapist where he can dig into you and stuff. <laughs> this time around, when I did a call with him, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm using Craig uh, for helping me out. And, and uh, he says, Oh, I know Craig. I say, you, you should recommend him more often. <laughs> Thank you. He's the one who bought you from Chicago. <laughs> so, so he was laughing about it. And he says, sure, I will, I will. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a good rapport. <laughs> okay. So uh, can we hear some, uh, some thoughts after watching that? Should I unscreen share my, my thing or am I okay here, Neil? I think you're okay, to be honest. I don't know if anyone's got any okay. comments. You unmute yourself if you've got a comment at all or anything you want to say. It did remind me of a, of a, of a guy I saw the other day. who he, he, um, I gave him this particular stretch to do and a, an exercise. And he came back, and he's quite an old guy, but he came back and he was, um, it was amazing. He described what he'd been doing, and it was completely different to what I'd said. Just everything all over the place, doing something he made up himself, and he was doing fine. So I'm like, okay, whatever, do that then. <laughs> but that guy reminded me of him. I don't know why. Well, I think that that's, a, that's actually a very um, apropos remark because the idea that people have to do things perfectly yeah. um, or that we're so smart and that we have the answers yeah. uh, is, is not so. If, if, if we give people an opportunity to play in the mud and even to, to fail um, uh, or to do things wrong, we're often surprised yeah. um, that, that uh, if they're comfortable with failure, um, that, that that is part of the environment that we want to create. We don't want them to feel like they're vulnerable. We don't want them to feel like uh, oh, you have this pelvic torsion and you need to do this and you need to do that. Like there's this, this, these uh, uh, precise steps. Uh, the body is very resilient and we want to help people to adapt. And part of adapting is, is being able to navigate the unexpected. Um, so there isn't just one way. There are many roads to roam. Um, and I think... Uh, we shouldn't be like a bad Pilates instructor where we're policing perfection all the time. Yeah. Uh, it gives people the idea that they're uh, susceptible and if they don't do things right, they'll become paralyzed. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm guilty of that. Uh, for most of my career, I'm guilty of that. And I think uh, you're describing a situation where you gave the, your patient the freedom um, even if it wasn't by your conscious intent, right. that person ha obviously had the freedom to, to, to just like willy nilly or misinterpret something like they weren't being obsessive compulsive about, oh, I better not do anything because what if I do it? What if I do it wrong? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, and, and it's quite often that you get patients who do the exercises wrong and that's okay. But it was, this guy was such a, um, such a, I, I'd got him to do a static uh, stretch to his glutes, holding it for 20, you know, for, for so many seconds and then swap sides, this kind of thing. And uh, I phoned him a couple of weeks later and he goes, yeah, no, I'm doing really, really well. I've got everything better. And that exercise you gave me where I bend my leg up and drop it into the side and back out again yeah. as fast as I can, 150 times. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I'm really good. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Carry on. <laughs> Levitt, had, Dr. Levitt from Prague had a famous line about that. He goes, the inventiveness of patience yeah. to, to yeah. corrupt the, your exercises. Is that's infinite. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, any questions from the gallery, please? Stone face? Nothing? What am I doing here? I think, uh, I think it's really nice. Uh, always, uh, I mean, I've, I've watched your um, uh, telehealth series, Craig, and uh, it's always very nice to see that. Um, corruption of their expectations because uh, that, that patient here said I was expecting you to dig an elbow in or and uh, 
Yeah. That's really, it's, like I say, it's so refreshing. Yeah, Puneet is, is not atypical. Um, it's hard to onboard people to the idea that, uh, uh, that telehealth can be of value. And so for me, the longer the pandemic has gone on, the better for my patient's resilience. Uh, because slowly, one by one, they, they come around. Um, you know, I had this problem. I didn't think you could help me. And then in one session, they're usually feeling better. Not always, but, but, but usually. And so Puni is a classic. He's a very interesting case. Um, he's from India, obviously. And he's a um, very, very uh, successful scientist and inventor and businessman. But um, he's had an interesting past. He has one-sided pain, uh, mostly in his head and neck on the left, but it goes all the way down the left side of his body uh, for, oh, 30 years. And it's disabling. It's severe uh, intermittently. And um, nothing has really given him lasting relief. He had a uh, brain surgery when he was younger, but uh, that was a benign situation. We don't know if that has an effect, but uh, emotionally, we can't say it's just that, that surgery. Um, emotionally, uh, he had an arranged marriage that was very um, uh, psychologically um, very difficult for him in his life. Um, and basically, his move to the United States 30 years ago was really an escape from his arranged marriage. Um, he immersed himself in his work like many people. He's a workaholic. Um, and so even though he's... He's been very successful um, um, uh, financially and in his business. Um, he has these other crosses to bear. Um, so is this a mechanical problem where I can find a specific pain generator uh, for his non-specific pain? I highly doubt it. I think that there is a social and a psychological component at least equivalent to the functional mechanical. Um, does that mean I will ignore the functional and the mechanical and assume it's all stress? Of course not. Um, we're going to find levers, hinges, uh, uh, starting points for getting a buy-in from the person. Um, but we want to see the person as a whole. And he's, he's a wonderful example of that whole package. And it's not bio, psycho, and social. Please listen and read Peter Stilwell's work, the, the DC PhD from Canada. S-T-I-L-W-E-L-L. -E -L -L. Uh, I will be happy to provide resources for you of a podcast and an article uh, or two by Peter. But this is a spectrum. Biopsychosocial is a spectrum. Um, and uh, we always have to look at the entire patient as a whole. Dr. Levitt always talked about the psychological milieu of patients. Um, of course, we know Lair Lorma Mosley talks about how important it is to see if a person is overprotective and are they you know, or they're fearful or anxious, and, and that creates um, a, a filter that slows down recovery. Um, and of course, uh, we know from Tim Gabbett's work, the great sports scientist, uh, that if people are fearful and overprotective, they become underprepared. And so now you're underprepared. So the, the littlest, the slightest breeze, and, and you become bent over um, and think that something's broken. Uh, and there are a myriad of physical therapists and chiropractors and osteopaths that are more than happy to give you a label for why you're bent over, for what tissue is the issue. And of course, now we know that the modern language of reassurance and reactivation from the guidelines of 1987 and 1997 is that people are overprotective and underprepared. And of course, we think about people being um, more fra more less fragile than they think they are and more resilient than they think they are, and that hurt doesn't necessarily equal harm. And so we can create an environment uh, where we can cause adaptation. It's through gradual exposure to feared stimuli. And this violates their expectations that they're about to break. Um, and this gives them the empowerment and the self-efficacy, the confidence, that they can withstand stress. Stress is a stimulus, and between the stimulus and response is a space, and in that space is our freedom to choose our response. Viktor Frankl, the great 20th century psychologist and Holocaust survivor. So stress is not a negative. And if a person uh, becomes bent over from every stress uh, and waits for us to fix them, um, then we have not really fulfilled our mission. Uh, 
outcome. So um, with respect to failure, um, I wanna share a video here. This is from a physicist. This is on YouTube, but it, it speaks volumes. I think the principal element of science is actually failure. The way I look at science is that I try to fail as fast as possible. I want to make some idea not work as fast as I can so that I can move on to the next one or by some kind of fortune, this idea survives all of my tests. That's what science is, surviving tests. And that's what we're trying to do to directly detect dark matter or to infer what its nature is from astrophysical phenomena. We're, we're trying to disprove ourselves. These failures are highly productive because we're still learning a lot about the universe. I think that the failures that we see in science are some of the most productive that I could imagine. So we want to fail as quickly as possible so that we can rule out the things that aren't going to work. In marketing, this has a uh, parallel. It's called the MVP, not your most valuable player in uh, Liverpool football, but, but the minimally viable product. And the minimally viable product is our starting point in rehabilitation. We don't uh, believe that, that rehab and musculoskeletal pain management is like baking a cake. It's not a recipe. It's, it's more like uh, being a sushi master chef where it's farm to table and you're personalizing for each individual. And the more you know about the person, the more you know about their biography, uh, the more you know about their uh, training history and injury history and fears and worries and concerns and yellow flags and what they've been told, um, the, the closer you can get uh, to uh, doing something where you'll get buy-in. And getting buy-in is, is the thing. We, we have to be able to explain the why behind the what of, of, of what we're doing. And if, you're an, if you have all the answers and it's all about you and your protocol and your kettlebell or your dry needling or your chiropractic adjustment, then it's not about them. But if it's about them, then you can really see this whole spectrum of their environment. And today with COVID-19, what's more important than the environment of the person? What if it's a, a low-income person? What if it's a person with, with, with the social determinants of health stacked against them? You can't just be asking them to change their lifestyle and eat better. They may not have ac access to, 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 to healthy food and healthy cooking. If you're asking them to become active and ride a bike and go hiking and run, well, maybe they live in an area where there's crime and they can't go outside. So you blame them for their obesity and hypertension that's behind all their non-communicable diseases and their musculoskeletal disability, well, that's being ignorant of the social determinants of health, which are upstream of lifestyle factors. So we don't wanna guilt people about lifestyle. And we shouldn't just have a simple-minded approach of, of I'm gonna find the specific cause of your pain and, and, and give you this prescription, this recipe, or I'm gonna fix you with chiropractic adjustment. Um, things are inherently a little more complicated uh, than that. And accepting uncertainty is the beginning point for us. As a science-based based profession, orthopedic surgeons should be encouraged and trained to value and recognize this, com this complexity. We live in a world where complex systems theory is the norm. There are so many interacting variables in each of your patient's lives. Now, this isn't just true for orthopedic surgeons. This is true for each and every chiropractor. So in human biology, like like the wonderful Matthew Lowe, who, who I hope has, has spoken to you many times, who is a neighbor of yours um, and a great physio, says in human biology where complex open systems interrelate, the idea of coming to the singular cause and effect model is probably just non-existent. Human beings are complex. Um, and uh, as Professor Mosley said, Accepting uncertainty is the way forward. So this makes us want to learn more about the person and their environment and what they believe and what ideas they have and how, how concerned or worried they are 
Uh, are they a boom and bust person who just wants a fix it approach? Or are they anxious, fragilista, that is afraid of even stepping outside for fear uh, that they'll re-injure themselves? Um, so uh, this is a really important idea from the physicist uh, about seeking failure. It's the scientific method. Uh, we begin with a hypothesis. We test it. We expect that we will be wrong, and then we modify our hypothesis. This is the model of deductive reasoning. This is the model of Sherlock Holmes. And it applies more to the clinical reasoning pathway and our scientific framework for musculoskeletal pain and disability um, than uh, an approach where we feign being a know-it-all or being so certain. So. Um, let me let you uh, ask some questions before we uh, go forward to the, the, the next slide. Thoughts from the gallery. So what are people's thoughts about the uh, label nonspecific pain? I know it's a very, very unpopular label. I'm not happy with it myself. I despise the label, but I'm not going to put in its place something um, artificial and make false claims for that. How do we deal with um, non-specific uh, back pain between, uh, interprofessionally? So the GP will recognize it as, um, as non-specific back pain, but if we call it a facet sprain, there'll be like, speak, a, speak my lingo, please. <laughs> uh, well, the GP um, isn't really our audience. Uh, and the GP has already been unmasked as somebody who uh, is not evidence-based. Um, all of you coming out of Bournemouth will be evidence-based practitioners, but uh, your real goal is with your patients. And the challenge that all of you should be uh, uh, attacking me on is well, what about the patient? They're not going to be happy with that. So I, uh, I would challenge you all to put yourselves in the shoes that you will be uh, wearing when you're in the clinic and when you're in practice and how you're gonna frame this for patients uh, because um, uh, none, of the, um, uh, none of the top experts who, who convene and come up with these guidelines and read the scientific literature are happy with the nonspecific label. Um, and I think Gordon Waddell, uh, the great, uh, a Scottish orthopedic surgeon who, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I think he said it best, you know, you can reassure a person that it's a mechanical problem and the prognosis is good, that there'll be bumps in the road, um, and that the, the key is to get you moving again. Um, the motion is the lotion, you're not fragile. Um, as far as what structure, we can explain that there are many structures. Uh, you may have uh, structural compromise. Uh, if a person's already had imaging and it shows a disc bulge or it shows degenerative arthritis. We don't deny those things. What we do is we say, well, we're, we don't want to have surgery, do we? And the person goes, no, I want to avoid surgery. So now you're, you're beginning to market to them. You're beginning to get on the same page. This is creating therapeutic alliance. And, and, and so now we're on the same side. So you say, well, if you have these issues and you also don't have a good core, or you're not lifting with a good strategy, or you're sitting too much, well, you begin to have multiple strikes against you. You hit a tipping point. So where can we get the most return on investment? Where can we maximize the value of our intervention so that you can become more stable? Um, and now you start to onboard a person uh, to working on the software issues as opposed to the hardware issues. Um, so we might, Give a metaphor for a person and say, you know, listen, if you have tight hamstrings, it's easier to loosen those than it is to change your arthritis. And if you have arthritis, the key to helping uh, your joints is to build your muscles around them. And this is not easy because when you have joint pain, your muscles are all going to throw the emergency brake. So we've got to start to gradually retrain the system. And so this is an example of how we would talk to a person without ever uh, having to say, well, it's this, or it's that, it's your QL, or it's your sacroiliac, or blah, 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 blah. Um, it's probably gonna be like 20 things, not one thing. Other thoughts? 
we sell, still have 21 people or are we uh, down to three or four, Neil? Did I turn everybody <laughs> off? No, we're still there. We're still there. Can, can I ask how you found patients perceive that diagnosis? That's not how a diagnosis. How have they accepted it? Okay, how, how have they accepted it? not it? a diagnosis and some patients abhor it. So what do you do in that circumstance? Uh, I, I explain to them that getting a scan is, a, is an option for them. And I explain uh, the first thing that we do in evidence-based approaches uh, is to uh, realize that there are false positives with scans. And so getting a scan isn't going to really tell us as much as we wish that it would. Okay, thank you. There's got to be more. There has to be a follow-up. You're British. They're sleepy. No, no. It's very hot here. What I love about Brits is you're very thoughtful and very uh, precise, and you dig in. So uh, this is this is this is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and at Bournemouth, I know you're exposed to uh, um, evidence-based approach. And at the end of the day, with patients, it's an art and it's a craft. It's not just a science. Um, so, uh, you know, we're not just about following the evidence. We're also about being rational and having theories. Um, and every patient is uh, another opportunity to develop connection. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is motivational interviewing and therapeutic alliance. And the way that we, um, the way that we help people to uh, uh, come to this, uh, to this modern approach and escape uh, Dr. Google and what they've heard and what they've been told before um, is by letting them tell their story in detail. I spend 45 minutes listening to my patients and reflecting what they said to make sure I've got their story right. And then I'm able to guide by the side better. Um, but if I go right to my exam and then tell them this is how it is, blah, 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 uh, then of course I would lose them in a, in a heartbeat. Any, Frank, you mentioned about else? building a therapeutic alliance with your patients by mentioning yes. you don't want to have surgery. Is that not almost fear mongering then and almost a selling yourself? No, because I don't think it really comes out that way. They usually say it before I say it. Fair enough. Yeah, most, most people will volunteer uh, that uh, they don't want to have surgery. Uh, when you lay out options, you know, you can explain that there are various options. Uh, and we want to give them the right treatment for them at the right time um, and the right recommendation. And that, you know, if you have uh, sciatica, obviously microdiscectomy is a elective procedure, um, but we want to avoid it. Um, obviously, a medrol pack is an option for sciatica. Obviously, an MRI is an option. Obviously, um, um, uh, epidural injections are an option. Uh, prescription NSAIDs are an option. Uh, traction is an option. McKenzie protocol is an, act, an option. Hinging or the, the big three neutral spine exercises are an option, as is Peter O'Sullivan's approach of, of confronting fear of flexion. Um, we don't know what that person will respond to. And um, a lot may depend upon their own preferences. With respect to exercise, there's poor evidence that specific exercise is superior to general exercise. And I'm sure Neil has, has spoken about this. Um, and what we know also is with respect to um, alternative therapies or adjunctive therapies, whether it's dry needling or chiropractic or soft tissue or traction, et cetera, that patient preference uh, is a robust predictor of what will, what will get the best response. So much is psychosocial. So much is about patient um, preferences, uh, expectations. So when I'm taking a history, I want to know what they, what they think is wrong. I want to know their intuition, what they've been told. I want to know what they think will help. I want to know, I, I ask them what they're expecting from, from today. And they may, and I, I know what they're expecting. There's five things people are expecting. They're expecting to find out what's causing their pain, uh, what I can do for them. Uh, what they should do, what they should avoid, and how long is it going to take. 
And the reality is, is that the first and the fifth are very tricky, slippery slope. As far as how long it will take, my crystal ball is in the shop. Like I'm not a soothsayer. And people will accept that, you know. Um, tendinopathy is the worst thing you can tell a person with tendinopathy is they're going to get better in, in six visits or six weeks. Tendinopathies, we know, will take six to eight months, generally speaking. And I would refer you to the work of Christian Thorberg, the great uh, uh, soccer uh, scientist and groin injury specialist uh, from, from Denmark, um, uh, one of the promoters of the Copenhagen adductor exercise. Uh, secondly, as far as the specific cause, we've already discussed this. So, so even though it's what people want, it doesn't mean you're always going to give people what they want. We want to find out what people expect, uh, but then we want to find out what their goals are. And this is called motivational interviewing. This is the art of motivational interviewing. When you, when you let them tell you what they're expecting, and then you ask what their goals are, and then you let their goals shape the process and you, you motivationally interview in them and you hear all about their story in, in all detail, past injury history, scans they've had, what they think is wrong, what they're expecting from the encounter, uh, what their concerns are, what their confidence is, what their tr past training history is, what their current training history is. When they tell all that and then you reflect on it and you repeat it back to them and say, did I get it? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? This is the most powerful way of onboarding people. And then, of course, I'm going to assess people. And when I assess people, my assessment is clandestine. My assessment is an exposure to feared stimuli. I'm going to see how they move. I'm going to see how their squat is. That's my assessment. Their single leg bias, their hinge, uh, their pushing and pulling and carrying. I'm going to see how their glutes and abs work. I'm going to see what their hip mobility and ankle mobility and toe mobility is like, what their T-spine mobility is like. Lo and behold, every exercise of the test is what, what Yonda taught. And so now I've already found out, A, what's, what's painful. And if it's painful, what's a red, yellow, or green light? B, what's a painless dysfunction? And C, what they're okay with, and, and, and D, what they're pristine with. And, and whatever is the painless dysfunction, the Gray Cook FMS1, that's probably going to be the starting point. And we'll explain that you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the rising tide lifts all the boats. And, and now we've taken the fear off because um, we're going to work on something that's a painless dysfunction, as Gray Cook says. Uh, and Quite when we start right. to raise the floor, they gain confidence. And then we go back to the stuff that was, that was red light, and it's probably yellow. And whatever is yellow light is probably green. Hi, Craig. Uh, my name's yeah. Marcus. I was wondering if I could interject. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, where we're uh, sort of trying to accept the uncertainty. Um, we, we appreciate that um, placebo is uh, a very big uh, part of uh, the treatment process. So how we impart that to our patient, we, we sh uh, I've got a little bit of a confliction that we kind of want to have confidence that what we're doing is going to be effective but also we're trying to navigate this uncertainty to the patient. So how should we sort of sail between them both? God, brilliant question. So that's the question of the, the two days together. Um, um, uh, Ian Coulter, who was a, uh, is a PhD from the Rand Corporation and was a former president of CMCC in Toronto, did a paper on patient satisfaction. And he said that uh, to sail between those two poles is uh, not a perfect science and you have to really thin slice and, and there's, no, there's no answer. But uh, if you give an optimistic prognosis, there are some people who are non-responders, like none of you are curing everybody. So if you give an overly rosy forecast, there's gonna be 10 or 15% of people that that you lose credibility with. In contrast, if you are more guarded so that you aren't proven wrong by the 10 or 15% of non-responders, um, there are people at the other poll who maybe won't get better as quickly as they would have because they needed you to be a cheerleader. So this, there is no answer to that question. And I love that question. I love that question. The more you get to know the person, the more you can get on track with that person. And that's the clinical art. And that's why motivational interviewing and therapeutic alliance 
are the beginning point for all of you. Learn how to take a history or history. Learn how to receive the story. Let it breathe. And, and this will enhance your results and it will give you the slack so that you have the wiggle room. The person will cut you more slack. They will accept you as the Alfred who will be their guide. One of the best lessons I ever learned was an orthopedic surgeon I shadowed for a number of years. And he always said to the person, listen, you know, you don't need surgery. So right away, they were like relieved. And he became their, their, their trusted ally because he wasn't railroading them into surgery. And then he would order tests and he'd send them to this person for this therapy and give them this pill. And he'd say, I'll see you in a month. And by the time they had exhausted everything and they were clamoring for the surgery, he, you know, he said, okay, we'll do the surgery. And then he would say, well, here's the risk factors. And he'd give them all of the risk factors, infection, this, that, the other. He would tell them the success rate. And, and by doing that, I saw him with the failures. I saw him with the people who opted for the surgery and the surgery didn't work and they were still thinking he was their captain. So he never lost those people. And that's a lesson that I, that I never, never, never forgot. Does that help? Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, I mean, I wish there's just like an answer. We have to get out of these uh, uh, univariate ways of thinking. It's complex systems theory. It's chaos theory. Um, uncertainty is, is the rule, uh, not the exception. It's like my screen locked up here. Uh, while it's, uh, while it's, un go. while it's unlocking, just to kind of remind everybody tomorrow night at five o'clock is Leslie Haig doing uh, motivational interviewing for you guys. Oh, wow. You guys are lucky. So anybody who does, uh, sign up for the uh the webinar sunday with jan hertvinson and tyson beach and colleagues um again you'll um get half of the money rebated back to you and then um a hundred dollars is donated to a charity uh first principles of movement uh, will lose money on your admission um but uh you'll get access to last saturday's uh four-hour webinar and resources as well and we're doing a much deeper dive into this than we can do right here but uh uh, I want to show you this picture. So what does this picture trigger for everybody? It's a bit overwhelming. What's overwhelming? Well, you don't know where to look and what advice to take. Because it's, it's, it's a mixture of everything, really. And what's what put yourself in the in the golf shoes and the cleats, a person who's uh, being told a lot of different things and being given a lot of uh, cues, what happens to their performance? It, um, it would be pretty atrocious because they they'd be they'd be stumbling over a different a load of different um, advice, essentially. Yeah, and this is the norm, sadly. So a golfer um, doesn't hit a good shot down the the first fairway and immediately his partners are saying oh it's your grip uh oh uh you need you need to relax more oh you need to stiffen at contact uh uh get the weight on the balls of your feet uh etc etc plus there's the thoughts that the person already had beforehand um so we know that most of us are not very agile with handling cognitive cues. The number of cognitive cues should be kept to a minimum. Um, and, and as Nick Winkleman teaches with our Irish rugby, uh, often there shouldn't be any cognitive cues. It should be more of a metaphor, a picture. Um, so here when I'm teaching in China, obviously I have to be Alfred and guide by the side. I can't use any verbal cues, zero. But the universal language of movement coupled with the iPhone is a beautiful thing. So I show this person this picture and I don't say a word and he does that. I didn't say brace. I didn't say hollow. I didn't say the uh, lift your tummy up to the ceiling, get your body in alignment, stiffen your core. I didn't say anything. 
So as one of our great coaches from British Columbia, Coach Carmen Bott says, I'm big on giving feedback. I'm just not so big on giving cues. And as Dr. Levitt said, don't try to teach perfect patterns, correct, rather correct the key fault that is causing the trouble. Well, I think that uh, uh, we've gone too far with uh, motor control and we police perfection instead of exposing people to an environment where they problem solve on their own and stumble and get up and stumble and get up and stumble and get up. Um, thoughts, anybody? This idea of guiding by the side and not policing perfection is a, a big pivot. Uh, my, I can share with you my own mea culpa that, uh, you know, I was a promoter of motor control exercises and teaching pristine patterns, as is referred to often by experts in our field. They must have pristine form. Uh, it's almost like a Catholic thing um, in rehab. And uh, nothing, I think, could be further from the truth. It turns out uh, that we adapt and we don't adapt by uh, performing things perfectly the first time. You have to let a person get out of their comfort zone and like Icarus fly close to the sun and yeah, there's a little singe here and there, but uh, it's, it's by exposure to stress that that stimulus causes uh, change. And uh, if you stay in your comfort zone, there's no change. So as far as pain, the traffic light metaphor is one I presented to you a week ago. Um, and there's different versions of this. Some, the yellow might be like three to six, three to seven, four to seven. Green might be zero to three. Um, red might be seven to 10, but you get the idea. Um, hurt doesn't necessarily equal harm. And if you have somebody who's an elderly person with osteoarthritis, I had a patient recently, uh, she, she was told she needed surgery. She's got osteoarthritis. Her knee was puffy, swollen. Uh, she was guarded. She was protecting. She was managing herself away from load. She was atrophying. She was getting stiff. You know, rest isn't best. It equals rest. And so I had to explain that not every hurt equals harm and that we'd avoid red light, but yellow will look both ways before we cross and green is go. We don't need to comment on every little pain that's a one or a two. It can lead to sensitization. And, um, you know, we had to give a, a corollary image. And the corollary image was if your joints are vulnerable, the last thing we want is your muscles to become wasted and atrophied. And every week you overprotect, you become more and more underprepared, like an astronaut. An astronaut is atrophying, there's no gravity, no stress. They return from space, and what do they have? They have bone pain. And so when you explain this, people go, wow, okay. So I have pain from, from this wasting, this atrophy, and now I get it. It's not just the arthritis. And you know, and we can explain that, you know, a lot of people have arthritis and no pain, and some people have, uh, you know, pain and no arthritis. So, so it's not a one-to-one -one thing. There, there are other factors at play here. So let's intervene where, we, where the investment will be of value and let's, let's be logical. Let's start to train the system. Thoughts? Thoughts about the dialogue. I know you're not in practice yet, but imagine yourself with a 70-year-old who's overweight, been told they have osteoarthritis. What, is, what does this make you think of here? What is this showing? Two lines, right? Which is the, what is the blue line? It's function. What is the red line? It's pain. Does the red line improve right away or does it go up and down? It goes up and down. We have to create a gap so we focus on function. If you want your body to feel better, feel your body move better. The motion is the lotion. And this is all part of the modern report of findings. At LA Sports and Spine, we have a, 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 a motto, which is uh, function better to feel better. 
Uh, so we have to get away from chasing our tail. Dr. Levitt said he treats the site of symptoms as loss. I know Neil has taught you that. So the only difference between exercise uh, and rehab is that rehab is when there's pain. <laughs> That's the only difference. <laughs> we exercise regardless. People have to move. People have to move because they have valued life activities. So I want you to hear this you for take a second. more coaching and start a more supportive cast type role versus the hero fixer role and i think you got one you, i think it's a great patient care model you, you got people that are you know can look at you as like their their movement coach their health musculoskeletal health coach who can keep them in life and keep them you know in the valued activities that are meaningful to them um and you know some of the traditional models are great business models because i mean you can get people coming in for cracks and wax and sticks and needles and all these things and love it and want to come back for it for the rest of their lives um, and, and maybe that, and I don't think any of those things can't be involved as long as it's, again, what's the priority? It's, it, the priority should be off the plinth in life, doing valued activities, not how well you can change their symptoms with, with whatever your intervention of choice is. Because all, I think the research tells us it is not unique to many interventions to make pain change in the short term. I just, the problem's going forward. So pain change is like a cough drop. And the goal is to get upstream of that. There's a lot of placebos out there and we want to give people a positive experience with movement. That is crucial. And that's what McKenzie is all about. And um, uh, the way we give people a positive experience with movement is by creating safety and teaching them the traffic light metaphor. Um, and uh, obviously, if you want your body to feel better, feel your body move better, this is the science. So at the end of the day, if we take a step back, uh, this biopsychosocial model is very helpful, especially if we see it as a spectrum instead of three silos. And this modern debate raging on the internet between pain science and biomechanics is resolved if we resist the temptation to make it either or. If we focus on the social, and I'll finish with, with this, if we focus on the social, social determinants are upstream and they're drivers of lifestyle, of SNAP, smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity, stress, sleep, and social participation. The social determinants are upstream and only 20% of our health is determined by healthcare with the rest determined by our behaviors, our genetics, our environment, and our socioeconomic circumstances. So we wanna be empathetic and do the motivational interviewing and listen. And we wanna be compassionate and guide by the side and create a plan. So there is a higher purpose that each of you have to help society. This change is coming. And if nothing else, the pandemic and the convergence of the inactivity crisis with COVID-19 and racism has taught us that right here, right now, right here, right now, a change is coming and you can be the tip of the spear. You can be an ambassador of this change. Each and every one of you can be part of this process. So I want to empower you to give reassurance and reactivation, which is what Neil was teaching in 1997. It's been in the guidelines since 1987, and the modern 2020 version of this is to make sure that people are not overprotective or underprepared. So we want to identify attitudes and beliefs of overprotection and behaviors of underpreparation. And so my mission is to create an environment in which every person feels values, valued, inspired, and challenged. Beginning from their first visit, they should leave with tangible, tangible hope and an achievable plan. This is the job. And so we are, as Laura Mosley says, in the behavior game change. This is part and parcel of what we do. So it's not what people do with us. It's what people do when they leave us. And so it is in each and every one of your hands, your chiropractors. It is in each and every one of your metaphoric hands to create a better world for all who live in it. And our job goes way beyond back pain, way beyond musculoskeletal pain pain, way beyond non-communicable diseases of obesity and diabetes and hypertension and falls and frailty. It, it goes all the way. It reaches out to the social determinants of health, which is something that we now can appreciate. Um, so Neil, I want to thank you, all of you. I want to thank you uh, for your questions today. And hopefully we'll, we'll do this again. Hopefully you'll email me with questions. I might see one or two of you on Sunday. Um, uh, hopefully I'll see you in the future at FPM uh, Lab Immersions when we're traveling again. I know we'll be in Wales, and I also expect that we'll be somewhere in England. Um, but uh, 
when it's safe and I'm not in any rush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you guys very 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 much thank very you much. mate that's fantastic really really good and thanks ever so much for uh, i know you uh, you came back a second time because uh, you didn't feel great about the technical issues last time so i really appreciate you doing that it's really really good thank you mate we will catch you at some cheers. point soon see you later cheers everybody cheers now